Alright, this is the first of three videos on China under Mao, 1949 to 1960. I decided instead of doing how your book has it, domestic policies and consolidation of power separated out, I would look at them by decade. So this will be on the, the 1950s and it'll cover points that relate to both consolidation of power and domestic policies. In this first video, we're going to look at the period of 1949 to 1953, right after the uh, People's Republic of China was declared. So in Beijing on October 1st, 1949, Mao formally declared the People's Republic of China to have come into being. In his vision, China was to become a single-party state under his rule and ideology. The Yan'an years had prepared Mao and the Communist Party for rule, and they were prepared to implement their vision when they came to power. For administrative purposes, the country was divided into six regions, each governed by four officials – the chairman, the party secretary, military commander, and political commissar. The last two are military-related, which kind of indicates how central military control was to their political control. The CCP claimed the country was ruled by the party with the – or with by the people, with the party as its representative. In reality, there were two parallel hierarchies that existed within the Chinese government. There was the formal government, with Mao at the top as chief of state and Zhou Enlai as premier. And then there was the Communist Party hierarchy, which paralleled the government and provided the leading core for the government. The structure of China initially was similar to the Soviet Union, with a central committee and a politburo. This would be about 20 members of the Communist Party that made crucial decisions. The politburo operated under Mao's control, although he didn't initiate every detail of policy, and at times he didn't even attend politburo meetings. Nevertheless, nothing could be done that he might disapprove of. One other factor in the construction of the new government was how many former GMD officials were actually left in place. The Communist Party had primarily existed in the countryside and therefore didn't have a strong base of support in the cities. Therefore, they were forced by practicality to accept some of the old guard to stay in positions as leaders. Only those who were overtly pro-GMD or anti-communist were kicked out or executed. Although there was some sense of security among the communists that they had won the long civil war, there was still an air of concern over several problems confronting the country. Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists still existed off the coast of China on the island of Taiwan, and the United Nations continued to accept them as the rightful government of China. Within China, there was also still fear that a revolution could fall apart any day now. This atmosphere of uncertainty was only heightened by the Korean War, which would break out shortly after the declaration of the PRC. A clear sign of how dominant the new government intended to be was evident in the way it enforced its control over the outlying areas of China that had separated off in the past. The reunification campaigns of 1950 began pretty quickly after the PRC was declared, with People's Liberation Army troops being sent into regions like Tibet that were usually sites of resistance to central authority. Troops would help build roads in those regions to connect it to China, but they also did things like brutally repress any signs of independence that was brewing in the country. This included the substantial Buddhist population of Tibet that looked to their spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama, for authority and really didn't feel an alliance with China. Similarly, uh, Muslim populations in Xinjiang in the West were wary of an atheistic Communist Party rule in China. But the Communist Party sent in military forces to forcibly reunify them with China in 1950. The government also set about deliberately creating an atmosphere of fear and uncertainty through a series of anti-movements launched to rid China of the remaining elements of the bourgeois class that might be supportive of the GMD or Taiwan. 
In 1952, the Five Anti Campaign was launched against bribery, tax evasion, theft of state assets, cheating on labor and materials, and stealing state intelligence. This campaign was used to reduce the power of the bourgeoisie, as these terms were vague and cast a wide net. For example, a businessman keeping the books at his work could be accused of stealing state secrets and then fined or penalized until he was willing to submit to state authority. Further, the Chinese people were encouraged to inform on anyone they knew who was unwilling to accept the new regime. A special government department drew up a dossier on every suspected Chinese person. If an individual's dossier was dubious, they stood little chance of getting housing or work. To make matters worse, class labels were frozen by the mid-1950s, so if your parent was considered a bourgeoisie, you were too. Children inherited the labels. To be labeled a counter-revolutionary or reactionary could lead to severe punishment, and censorship became widespread as any song, book, or place name associated with the West or capitalism was renamed or banned. A particularly fierce anti-movement was the anti-landlord campaign. In the early years of the PRC, the government sought to take all property from landlords and redistribute it to the people. Some were allowed to keep their land if they were reduced to the status of peasants, but most were put on public trial and executed. Over one million landlords were executed in the early 1950s. This atmosphere was heightened when the PRC became involved in the Korean War in 1950. The war began with communist North Korea's invasion of US-backed South Korea. The US responded under the banner of the United Nations by sending in troops to defend the South. Zhou Enlai condemned this as an imperialist invasion. Mao, despite objections within his administration, sent supplies and troops to help North Korea. During the course of the war, three million Chinese troops fought in Korea against U.S. and U.N. forces. At home in China, this provoked anti-American propaganda and panic in the PRC that would set the tone for American relations for years to come. When the war ended, Mao claimed it as a victory for the Chinese and communism, which had successfully fought against the West. The victory in Korea also further consolidated Mao's own power and influence over China. Also during this conflict, the Chinese and the Soviet Union signed a formal alliance in 1950. The USSR gave China a $300 million loan, not a gift, which helped jumpstart Mao's economic reforms. This debt to the USSR, though, left a sour taste in Mao's mouth, and once it was paid off, he was reluctant to ever again accept aid from the Soviet Union. Mao was determined to industrialize China on a similar scale to the Soviet Union, hopefully surpassing it eventually. This led to the inauguration of the PRC's first five-year plan, lasting from 1952 to 1957, relying on a Soviet model of industrial development. This meant agriculture would need to be modernized as well as industry invested in the cities. The agricultural reforms were simpler for the communists to make as they had experience from years of operating in the countryside. Also in the countryside, the egalitarian values of the CCP worked well with self-interest, taking land from people that already didn't support them, giving it to those who did support them, uh, was easy. Years later, peasants would still recall Mao as the person that gave them land. However, in the cities, it was more complicated, as the elites in the cities were not just landlords that had inherited land. They had real skills and expertise that were necessary to keep the economy going. Massive reform could not take place, Liu Shaoqi observed, um, in the cities unless communism was sold to those at the top by convincing them that they would be able to keep their status. Another issue was that bosses who knew their factories were going to be taken over and therefore was going to be somebody else's problem were reluctant to fix any broken equipment or really care for it very well. While the initial economic plans of Mao were 
fairly similar to the Soviet Union, in 1957 economic policy would take an extreme left turn. 